Well, good evening, and good to, good to see you tonight, and to come on in, grab you a hymn book, and uh, as we begin tonight, we're going to start with 257. I see those hands, but how about 257, farther along, and uh, tempted and tried. That's what we talked about this morning in the service. Tempted and tried, we're all made to wonder. Almost sang this this morning, but, uh, but we didn't. So 257, let me hear you sing as we begin the service now. Tempted and tried, we're all made to wonder why you should be lost all the day long. While there are others living about us, and we're all resting, though in the wrong. We know all about it. singing now farther along you know what one day it'll all make sense won't it until then well keep staying faithful when death has come all that second now when death has come Take us to glory all that last now. When we see Jesus coming in glory, when he comes from his home in the sky, then we shall be him in the sunshine. We'll understand it all by and by. Father along, we'll know all about him. song okay and a uh, little other song says in the middle of it cheer up my brother you ever notice some of those you know the number of songs that talk about having joy and cheer and happiness and peace i wonder why songwriters wrote that because we had, we definitely need that don't we and uh, cheer up my brother and uh live in the sunshine live in the sunshine good to see you tonight thank you for being here can you believe this is our last sunday night in November. Oh. But it is Sunday night. It's always next November if the Lord tarries his coming. That's right. And uh, so, and Lord, hey, hope, I'm praying the Lord comes back before no, next November. But if not, let it be known this day, we'll serve the Lord next November, won't we? And uh, let's praise God for that. Well, let's, let's pray. Ask the Lord's blessings upon uh, our service tonight and ask the Lord to meet with us. Speak to our hearts and draw us close to him. Elias, glad you got a chance to come home for a bit. Are you, are you longing for Oklahoma right now? Are you longing to, stay lo longing to stay longer here at home? Yep. How many more years now? Uh, I was curious if he was already counting down the years, thinking, oh, I just got to handle on just a little while longer, right? Cheer up, my brother. Live in the sunshine, right? <laughs> and I'm glad you got a chance to come home this weekend. Would you ask the Lord to meet with us today? Yes. 
Amen. You can be seated for a moment. And I uh, just want to remind you a few things of the, uh, uh, on the announcements. Um, next Sunday is food day. Okay, food day. So if you want to bring some holiday favorites for that. And if, you're, if your family holiday favorites ham or your favorites holiday favorites a turkey or stuffing or something like that, that's fine. If, you, uh, if you're a family that your holiday favorites is Mexican food, that's fine. You can do that too. And so, but uh, that's what we're going to kind of do. And I have a little holiday meal together. And uh, that's next Sunday. Don't, don't forget that. Next Saturday is Family Saturday, so there will be no organized soul wedding. But the kids, first through sixth grade, if, if they're interested in coming, we will leave here at 11 o'clock and uh, come and be a part. The cost will be $5 per person, and that's for those that are skating. So if you're, if you're an adult and you want to go with your children uh, ice skating, feel free. You can come. And you say, but I don't want to skate. I just want to go. Then there's no cost. And uh, so it won't cost you anything. The $5 is just for the skating, and really that's half off. And uh, so we don't, we don't have to do the decorations and stuff like that. So we'll subsidize some of our kids to, to make sure that they can go. And we have some, uh, some bus kids, too, that are interested in coming with us. And, uh, you know, they ought to be a part of the church, too, right, and come take part in the activities. And uh, so we're, we're glad for that. And, again, bring a wrap gift, <clears throat> kiddos. The, the gift exchange is not just so you can have uh, the most expensive uh, uh, toy or something like that. But it's just a matter of, hey, we just stop and have a little gift, gift exchange, boys with boys, girls with girls. I don't think there's any girls that want any boy toys, right? No, no. And <laughs> girls, yeah, yeah, well, look what happened. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, boy, boys, you don't want girl toys, do you? No. Yeah, no, no, good. I'm glad the, I'm glad the boys are saying no, that's for sure. <laughs> And, uh, you know, girls, girls, we can give them a little bit of leeway. Boys, there is no leeway. Yeah, no leeway. Boys do not play with girls' toys. I, I played with my sister's Barbies as a kid. And uh, they would say, you want to come play? And I'd say, sure. And, and, and I'd go on there, and I'd play with their Barbies like I played with my G.I. Joes. I'd take them apart. I'd grab them by their head, and, they, and I had my, you know, go, Joe. And, and uh, let's look, you know, not the, not the hand cleaner stuff, but uh, and I'd bring my G.I. Joe and his machine gun in there, and Barbie would lose a head. And I'd pop it off, and my sisters would just go nuts. And I was like, it's okay. They go back on. And uh, I'd throw the head at them and everything. And they quit asking me to play Barbie with them after a while. I don't know what the deal was. And uh, so that's the only time uh, that I played with that. But, uh, hey, that's for uh, next Saturday coming. And uh, look, look forward to that. Again, parents, we're not asking to spend a lot of money, uh, maybe, maybe a $10, $15 maximum on, on the, uh, the gifts. Just something simple and uh, come be, make it wrapped. And, and if you could help us out, mark the boy toys boys and the girls toys girls. And we'll separate those. That way we don't have a, uh, a – and even if you, you get a non-gender specific toy, if you have a girl, then let it go in the girls pile, okay? And uh, that, way, that way we don't end up with a boy getting a Barbie somewhere and he's like, Seriously? And it's like, you can, you can give it to your sister. I don't have one. You know, that's like, ugh, you know, that, that's never fun. So uh, it's kind of like our, our gift exchange for the adults. Christmas, when we had all the kids with us, every now and then, some of you adults grab one of the kids' toys. And the kids are looking at you going, oh, that's not fair. And you're like, want to trade? And then they saw what you had. And they're like, no. <laughs> so, uh, or, or whatever, vice versa. So, yeah. So, uh, so we're trying to help uh, that. That's, that. We'll have a good time with that. Looking forward to the kids' Christmas party. So that's next Saturday, just coming up. That's Family Saturday, so make sure you're aware of that. Again, no organized soul winning. Prayer meeting with the Muscle Ministries prayer meeting will be the week after, okay? And uh, if you're not going to the prayer meeting and you, well, you want to go soul winning, we'll still have tracks and stuff set up on the table. And you can come, grab your partner, maybe even converse with somebody ahead of time. Hey, I need someone to go with me soul winning. And, uh, you know, you can, you can do that. Um, and be able to go out soul winning even while the prayer meeting is taking place. And so just looking forward to a couple of events coming on around the corner. And uh, out of curiosity, how many of you men are interested in preaching at the watch night service? There's two, three, four, five, six. You going to be here, Elias? Amen. Six. All right. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Did I see? Oh, James, you're preaching? All right. And uh, Isaiah, did you? Did I see a hand, Isaiah? I didn't see a hand on Isaiah? No? I think that, that must have been Thomas in front of you raising his hand. Yeah. So, Thomas, prepare to sign up. Okay? Prepare to sign up. And, uh, and maybe this is why young men aren't preaching, or surrendering to preach in our church, because they say, you know what? If you surrender to preach, our pastor is going to make you preach. And listen, if God calls you to preach, you got to preach. And, uh, hey, don't wait. Don't wait to start in Bible college, right, Elias? 
And uh, you don't want to wait then and start and have your preacher start first. You might have get, get going here in children's church and stuff like that and get you some practice and experience. And uh, that way you go to Bible college, other guys think, you already, you, what are you doing here? You've already got this figured out. <laughs> He's like, no. And uh, so, hey, have an opportunity and looking forward to that. And those of you, if there's another one of you, some other men that say, you know what, I, I think I'll make a, you know, a little venture at it. And what I enjoy about this is some of you, you men, you sit down and write a sermon. And then you come tell me about you writing the sermon. I had this thought, this idea, and I, and I wrote this, and I, and I got like half a sentence written on my piece of paper, and I stared at it for eight hours. And I balled it up, threw it away, and I started all over again. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> I can't take a number of pieces of paper I've thrown away. Thank God for computers nowadays. Now it's just control A, delete. And uh, just, uh, yeah, you like control A. Yeah, that's how it works. Yeah, just, and um, amen. Well, let's sing another song this evening. I'm looking for, see if we have an adult anywhere. Look at all the kids. You have one. Okay. 24. 24. <clears throat> the next time he comes. Hymn number 24. Trying to get our adults an opportunity there. Hymn number 24. The next time he comes. I like how the songwriter said here, he'll be coming for me, right? Coming for you too, I hope, if you're saved. Hymn number 24, sing that first verse with me. coming for you? Hey man, look and see if there's another adult anywhere, another adult, and I was looking, and uh, there's no adults? I am. Oh, you're an adult. Oh, you had your hand up? I was. <laughs> Unless I'm wet that might be a good thing. Yeah, amen. <laughs> 143. 143. 143, this has got to be a Christmas song. on Christmas Day, 143. Now don't get lost. Half of the song's on one page, half's on the other, okay? So we get to that other page, just jump. 143, yes. Yes. There it is. That's the song I'm looking for. Hymn number 143. Anybody not know this song? Got two, three? Okay. Well, it'll sound familiar as soon as we start singing it. So 143 now.
forth the She said 492. All I need, okay. Jesus Christ is made to me. How many of you don't know this song? 492. Anybody not know this one? Melody, you don't know it? Two, three? All right. It's pretty easy. He is all I need. By the way, Brother Matthews, he's got a good bass part. I like this one. Got it in there. So. Sing it with me now. second verse men you sing the all I need all I need and everybody on the chorus so ladies you start off now he read me verses after you take a moment and shake some hands tonight.
Well, 492, let's sing those last two verses. Jesus is my all in all. Verse 4, 492 now. So if he's all you have, is that enough? Yes. It should be, right? Then thank God. I'm glad to know I have him. Amen. Amen. It's not just I hope to get him or hope one day to have him or hope uh, I can get to him or he can get to me. Uh, he that hath the son hath life. So that means you can have the son. And he that hath not the son of God hath not life. And these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the son of God that you may know that you have Amen. eternal life. I know I've got him. Thank the Lord for that. Well, it's time for offering. Let's just pray and ask the Lord's blessings. Uh, upon our offerings, Brother Hood, would you ask God to bless this evening? Today, being the last Sunday in November, it's also adult night. <laughs> Miss Talia, I see that hand there. 53, hymn number 53. And uh, kids are like, what do you mean adult night? It's a night for picking adults to, to choose the songs. And uh, 53, when I survey the wondrous cross. And uh, be careful as you sing this one. Oftentimes we sing about the cross and it's just something else we sing about. We sing about the cross as though we sing about anything else, but you're singing about the time your Savior hung up on a tree for you. He shed his blood. He suffered. He bled. He died. And as you sing about it, his suffering is now your song because it gave you salvation. And be mindful. This is not just a song. This is what he endured. So 53, think about the words now. We.
Instruments, you start us in and then drop off. Let's sing that last verse a cappella. Give it all your heart now. singing there you can be seated I still see some adult hands going up and uh, well it's a good place to stop right there with the cross isn't it and uh, that's a wonderful song and I appreciate Miss Pallia picking it I ask that you would be in prayer for Miss Carolyn Amoroso she's been on our prayer list uh, for a great great amount of time now with uh, some, some uh, health needs and uh, now she's in the hospital uh, with a UTI and so uh, she's struggling with that and they're pulling excess fluid uh, from her as well, so she may be there overnight. So if you would be in prayer for Carolyn Amoroso at this time as she goes through that great deal of difficulty. So appreciate those that pray for our prayer needs and uh, take not only a prayer list home, but to actually go through it and, and pray for those needs of others. And uh, as we consider those that are on our prayer list, I'm glad to know that, you know, as far as being on a prayer list, I'm not the one that's in the hospital. I'm not the one that's in the cancer. I'm glad that, you know, my name being on the prayer list is asking for God's power and God's strength and God's wisdom, you know, those things. And uh, so and I'm grateful for those that do pray for your pastor, that God might uh, give me what I do not have to do the job that he's asked me to do. And grateful for that opportunity. So thank you for those that pray. Take your Bible tonight to 1 Samuel. 1st Samuel chapter 4. 1st Samuel chapter 4. How many of you have ever heard of a young man by the name of Samuel? Oh, did you just teach on that? Oh, okay. You, chapter, you taught on chapter 3? Wonderful, wonderful, because I was going to... Uh, yeah, there goes half the introduction right there, and uh, except the adults, the adults weren't in there, so they need to catch up with what's going on, right? Samuel, you've heard of Samuel, right? Samuel was a, a young man, and he's uh, been dropped off to, to live there in the temple. And uh, hey, who can tell me, who raises Samuel? Oh, come on. Who? Huh? Eli. That's right. Not that Eli. <laughs> different Eli. So, uh, so different Eli. Hey, Eli, the, 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 the prophet there, he, he's going to raise Samuel. And interesting thing that I find here as you read about Eli and Samuel and the relationship, Eli had sons. And the way God had designed things, it was, this, it was one generation after the next that would continue to serve God in the priesthood. And, and, but Hophni and Phinehas, what, they, were, they were trouble. They were wicked. And by the way, let me just say this, and I'm not saying anything against my children or any other children, but just because someone's a preacher's kid doesn't mean they live for God. Okay? And uh, just saying, hey, and we, I know a lot of folks that hey, grew up in preacher's homes, and, and listen, they're so far away from God now. And, and, and sometimes, we, 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 you know, we, we ask the question like the Pharisees did, who did sin? Was it the parents or was it the kids? And can I just say, we don't always know the whole story. Don't try to fill in the blanks. It's not your, listen, I've known folks that as, I, as, I, as a young married couple, my wife and I, we both looked at each other and said, if we could be a fly on the wall of anyone's house, we would like to be a fly on the wall in so-and-so's house because we want to learn how to raise our children like they do it. And some of those kids didn't turn out right. 
They might have, yeah, that would have been, that would have been dangerous for sure. Hey, Eli, back to our story, he didn't have, his, his sons were wicked. His sons took advantage of their position, took advantage of the people. His sons did not have a heart for God. His sons led the people away from God, and, and, and the people of God suffered much because of it. During that same time, listen, because Hophni and Phinehas were so wicked, and people knew it. By the way, Eli knew it too. You can go back to chapter 3, and he knew it too. He knew what was going on, but he never dealt with the situation. He never, as far as we can tell, never dealt with his sons. And so God in chapter 3 raises up a young man named Samuel, and he tells Samuel all the things that he's going to do to Eli's house. And, and, and if you go back to chapter 3, those of you that learned that with, with Brother Seifert, if you just imagine for a moment, can you imagine being Eli saying, Samuel, what did God tell you? And the Bible says Samuel told him everything. Can you imagine being Samuel? This young kid, uh, well, <laughs> this is what God said. Now, talk about uncomfortable, but then imagine being Eli listening to a young child tell him what God said he was going to do to his house. This is the environment we find in Israel this day, and, uh, and God's not pleased. God's not pleased because of the priest. God's not pleased because of the people. And listen, God is raising up a young man by the name of Samuel that is going to eventually lead Israel to, back to serving God. And then Israel themselves would reject Samuel. And, uh, and God would have to tell Samuel, Samuel, it's not you they have rejected, but me. Now, we've just fast forwarded quite a bit. Jump with me to chapter 4 now. Chapter 3, that's when Samuel, he, he's called out by God, and, and he tells uh, Eli all that God has said, and, uh, and we find that story in chapter 3. Chapter 4, let's begin reading there in verse 1. The Bible says, And the word of Samuel came to all Israel. By the way, when it's speaking of the word of Samuel, Samuel got his word from where? From the Lord. So when they heard the word of Samuel, who were they hearing from? The Lord, that's right. So remember that. Now Israel went out against the Philistines to battle and pitched beside Ebenezer. And the Philistines pitched in Aphek. And the Philistines put themselves in array against Israel. And when they enjoined battle, Israel was smitten before the Philistines. And they slew of the army in the field about 4,000 men. So many of us know the story of, of the Philistines and, and Goliath of Gath and David, right? It's another one of those battles. This is happening before David and Goliath. Once again, the Philistines fighting with Israel. And this time, it's not Israel that wins, but it's the Philistines. The Philistines kill 4,000 men of Israel. And when the people were coming to the camp, the elders of Israel said, Wherefore hath the Lord smitten us today before the Philistines? Let us fetch the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of Shiloh unto us, uh, uh, that when it cometh among us, it may save us out of the hand of our enemies. So the people sent to Shiloh, and they, that they might bring uh, from thence the ark of the covenant of the Lord of hosts, which dwelleth between the cherubims. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with, with the ark of the covenant of God. And when the ark of the covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted with a great shout, so that the earth rang again. Can you imagine what's going on now? They said, why did we lose? Let's go get the ark that the, that the ark might save us. And they called a Hophni and Phinehas and they deliver. Here comes Hophni and Phinehas with the ark. Can, can, can you imagine them for a moment? Here, here come the priest and they're carrying it, by the way, not like Brother Raspberry's message not too long ago, right? But they're carrying it on staves. And here comes the ark. And the people are shouting, yeah! Whoa! And they're shouting. Now this battle going on, right? And the earth rang with the shouts of all of Israel. Hey, uh, Philist Philistine may have won now, but we're fixing to clean their clock because the ark of God is here. Imagine the excitement. Continue reading. Then when the Philistines heard the noise of the shout, they said, what meaneth the noise of the, this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews? Well, they're getting nervous, aren't they? And they understood that the ark of the Lord was coming to the camp. And the Philistines were afraid, for they said, God is coming to the camp. And they said, Woe unto us, for there hath not been such a thing heretofore. That's a sad thing to say. Shouldn't have God have been there a long time ago? And they said, This, this should never happen. Woe unto us, 
Who shall deliver us out of the hand of these mighty gods? These are the gods that smote the Egyptians with all the plagues in the wilderness. They heard the stories. Notice what the Philistines said to each other, verse 9, Be strong and quit yourselves like men, O ye Philistines, that ye be not the servants unto the Hebrews as they have been unto you. Quit yourselves like men and, what's the next word? Fight. Fight. Who do you think is going to win? Well, some of you know the story. Don't jump too far ahead. And the Philistines fought and Israel was smitten. Wait a minute. I thought God was there. The Philistines fought and Israel was smitten. Wait a minute. I thought there was a great shout. I thought the ark was there. Continue reading. And they fled every man into his tent. And there was a very great slaughter for their fell of Israel. 30,000 footmen. First they killed 4,000. Now 30,000 dead. And the ark of God was taken. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas were slain. Now for the sake of time, we're not going to read the rest of the chapter, but right, let me encourage you, read the rest of the chapter. It's a, it's a sad chapter. I'll just quickly tell you, Hophni and Phinehas, they die. Eli dies. Eli has a grandson that's born. And listen, as his grandson's born, Mama dies, and she named her child Ichabod because the glory of God has departed out of Israel. Sad chapter. Preacher, what are you preaching from this? I want you to notice what the enemy said in verse 9. Be strong. Quit you like men. Huh, you ever read that and go, what does that mean? How do you quit like a man? Let me say this, young, young men, and old men alike, men don't quit. Not when it's time to fight. Not when it's time to do what's right. We don't quit. And I'll explain to you what this means here in a moment. But I want to talk to you on that subject. Quit ye like men. I want to pray you'd help us tonight as we just stop and examine this story for a moment and just examine what the enemy says and, Lord, what they did. Not that we might draw strength from the Philistines, but God, that we might acknowledge our responsibility to stay faithful unto you. God, we thank you for your goodness, and we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your provision. We thank you for what you've done in our church, Lord, the growth that we've seen this year. We thank you for the new folks that have come, the souls that have been saved, and others baptized. We thank you for, Lord, the new families we've seen added unto us. God, you've been so good. Lord, help us not to quit doing what we ought to do, that we might see your blessings extended to the next generations. Help us, God, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Quit ye like men, the Philistine said. Before you begin maybe to think that I'm preaching on what the enemies of God said, might I just remind you in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 13, Paul would say to the church in Corinth, Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, be strong. The word quit here is not referring to giving up, but refers to, listen, the word means to be as or to act like, to show yourselves as. It's interesting if you look at the Hebrew word that was translated quit ye right here. Uh, many times in the Old Testament, it, there, are, there are tenses of the verb to be. To be. So when it's emphasis on, hey, not just be men, but there's an emphasis on here on equipping yourself or showing yourself as a man. Don't just say you're a man, they're saying. Hey, it's time to man up, modern day vernacular. They're about to go out to war, and, and listen, the Philistines are scared, and, and they said, hey, this has never happened before, and the gods of Israel are going to destroy us. We heard what they did in Egypt. We heard what they've done before. We've heard what happened in the wilderness, and now we're next, so it's time to man up, yeah. is what they're saying. Now, let me apply this to us for just a moment. Why do we say man up to us? 
Why should we take note of what the enemy said in this day? Well, can I just remind you for a moment? Hey, back up in, in what we just read in 1 Samuel chapter 4, and I want you to notice some things that are pretty messed up. Now, didn't the, didn't the enemy say God is there? And yet, who won? The Philistines. Not only did they kill more men, listen, multiplied more men. But what was going on in Israel? Hey, the ark of God was there. The priests were there. The shouts were there. The excitements were there. All the things that make, make it appear as though Israel is going to come back and conquer and win. Listen, it appeared that way. However, there were some things missing. I want you to notice something first of all. Look at verse 3. When the people were coming to the camp, the elders of Israel said, Wherefore hath the Lord smitten us today before the Philistines? They said, God, Hey, God has brought this on to us. Why did God do this? Might I just remind you, God told them why in chapter 3. Yeah. Hey, Eli, you're not raising your sons. You're not dealing with the sins of your children. Hey, the, the priests are out of control. I'm going to wipe them off this earth. That's why. By the way, chapter 4, that's what happens. They're all dead. Why did God do this? Hey, listen, they did not recognize the sin of the people. But then I want you to notice this. They said, let us fetch the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of Shiloh unto us that when, notice this, when it cometh. When what cometh? The ark. When it cometh among us, notice, it may save us. Might I just remind you the ark was just a piece of furniture. The ark was just a picture the ark, listen, was not God. The ark only represented that God was there with Israel. But the ark is not God. Now, they had the excitement, they had the ark, they, but their trust was all in the excitement and their trust was all in the ark. And how does that apply to us today? Well, might I just remind you in our independent, fundamental, Bible-believing, missionary, King James letter, narrow piece of literature, Baptist churches, right? Don't, sometimes we've got to shout, don't we? Amen. Preach on the King James Bible. Hey, in most independent Baptist churches, if you preach on the King James Bible, you get a few amens. Yeah. But you should have a whole lot more omes because nobody's reading them. Hey, we talk about, listen, we support missionaries. Praise God, we have hey, over 40 missionaries supported to sit around the world to, to, for the cause of Christ. And yet, many independent Baptist churches, they don't go so winning on, them, on their own. They'll send missionaries to go to the work that they themselves won't do at home. Yeah. Mm. That's getting quiet again. We lost our shout now. Hey, we'll, we'll, we pull out the hymn book, right? Hey, and we say to ourselves, hey, we're not going to compromise. We're going to sing the old hymns of the faith. And yet we listen to a bunch of junk at home. Monday through Saturday we listen to things that dis honor and displease God. But come Sunday, we got the hymns of the faith. We ain't compromising on that. You know what we're doing? We're trusting that just because our church is on the right stand and the right path, and just because we have this and that, hey, we got the right standards, we got the right book, we got the right shout, we got the right, hey, we didn't cancel our services. We got Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. Hey, we, we amen, preacher, bore church. And yet, sometimes we're in church and we're not even engaged. Is a preacher, is this, is this a shearing message? You know, no, 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 I'm just, I'm, apply, I'm, I'm speaking in generalities in Christendom today. This is the way it is. Even in our type of churches. And we trust more in the things that we hold fast to than we do the God of heaven that told us to hold fast to them. And we say, why are we losing? Because it's not our standards, it's not our music, it's not the King James Bible, it's not, listen, our missionaries that are on the wall. Hey, that's not what's doing the work. It's Him. You know, why? No, don't misunderstand me. You said, preacher, you said it's not the King James Bible. Listen, this book would do nothing if it weren't for the God of heaven. It was the God of heaven that gave this book and the God of heaven that preserved this book and the God of heaven that allowed us to hold it without Him. We wouldn't have it. It is a tool, yes. This is the Word of God, but it's not just powerful because it's what we call the King James Bible. It's powerful because it's God's Word. It was Him that spoke it. Sure. Now, the people had all the right things, all the right shout, and they lost. 
And the enemy looked at them and said, quit ye like men. Too many, too many, too many today are starting off right and giving up and quitting. Let me illustrate for just a moment. We sent our kids off to Bible college. I can say that because Elias is here today. We'll send our kids off to Bible college and expect them to stay true to the faith which we believe in. And they come home and they're compromising. And more and more Bible colleges, they are compromising. But oftentimes we point the finger there, but might I just remind you before we ever do that, how many moms and dads, as soon as kids are outside the house, they compromise on the standards by which they even raise their children in. Well, we used to, well, why'd you used to do that? Well, I had to, I had kids. So it was only right because you had kids? Or was it right because it's right? Listen, your standards of living ought not be just because you have kids, but because this is what God of, the God of heaven expects you to live by. And how many parents, listen, they're going, they're compromising, and then our churches are compromising, everybody's compromising. And listen, so many are quitting and walking away, and listen, it's not just men, but ladies and teenagers, and listen, all, all the like, they're quitting on the things of God, the things that they used to hold fast to, and now they're off to the side. Might I say, now's the time not to quit, but to quit like men. Now is not a time to give up, but to man up. Now, ladies, I'm not being derogatory to you. If you would prefer, I'd say, lady up. Hey, it's, it's time to man. Listen, it's time we stand some ground. Is anybody tired of seeing the white flag and Christianity waved? Is anybody tired of, listen, watching me, the media and, and, and politics and everything else? Listen, push the, the Christian into the corner, into the darkness. And listen, you can't talk and you can't tell nobody and you can't say what you believe and you can't live like you believe it. Listen, we're, we don't want your religion shoved down our throat. That's what they say. Anybody tired of that kind of? Amen. Oh, yeah. Let's just say, listen, I'm just, as your pastor, I just think it's time for us to quit like men. It's time to man up and it's time to do some things that while we're in the battle, hey, we're not the ones losing, but we're the ones pushing forward. Remember Jesus said the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Man, and the gates, listen, are not an offensive thing, but a defensive thing. So we're supposed to be on the offense. We're supposed to be pushing forward, not retreating back and defending. The Lord will do the fighting and the defending for us. Let's push on. Let me give you tonight... Just some areas of life that we'll do these three. These are three simple things. And by the way, it's nothing new, but I think it's something that we've gotten away from sometimes. And as we get away from it, listen, we quit instead of quit like men. First of all, what do we need to do as Christians? We must stand and make this book our book. Preacher, what do you mean? That, that, that is, we, we only read the King James Bible. No, no, no. I'm not saying to where we possess it, but we make it ours. David said in Psalm 119, verse 11, right? Thy word have I hid in mine heart. Not my word have I hid in Jackson's heart. <coughs> Good morning, Jackson. <laughs> he didn't get a nap today. That's not what he said, right? He didn't say, my word have I hid in your heart, or my word have I hid in my bookshelf. My word have I hid on my cell phone. My word have I, thy word have I hid on my laptop. Thy word have I hid on my coffee table. Thy word have I hid on my desk in the drawer underneath 18 pieces of paper. What did he say? Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. And listen, as we consider for just a moment, listen, the word of God is definitely important. Luke 4, 4, Jesus said, it is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Do you not believe that? He said every word of God. However, an interesting thought here. In Luke, he said that in Luke 4. In Luke 5, the Bible says, it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God. He stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. 
Imagine with, with me for a moment what's going on. Hey, the people wanted to hear the Word of God so much, they followed Him all the way to the lake to where they could follow Him no longer. And even as He, as he left land and got into a boat and thrust out, the people kept pressing forward to hear the Word of God. Might I say in our churches today, just again, speaking churches in general, hey, we don't want to hear more Word of God, we want to hear less Word of God. Bible, well, listen, Bible messages are a thing of the past, aren't they? Now it's all of, of life stories, and let me tell you, hey, we like a funny joke, and hey, we go to, to, to teen camp, and we, we like the teen camp speaker that tells all the funny stories and all the jokes, but what about all the Bible messages that you're supposed to get from him? Hey, what, when, are, when is this book going to be our book? And we press on to hear it. Oh, I just, I just got to hear it more and more and more and more. Consider this. You say this is our book. Do we speak it boldly while on our day-to-day -day business? Acts chapter 4, verse 31, When they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the Word of God with boldness. I'm talking about making this book our book. Listen, this ought to be our final authority of all matters of faith and practice. And somebody says to you on the job, hey, let's go do this. And you say, nah. And they say, why not? Where's the boldness of the Christian? They say, well, God's Word says I'm not supposed to be taking part in any of that. You mean actually like quote it to them? <gasps> Surprise. Here's what we do. No, you know what? I'm busy. I just don't have time. Isn't that what we do? Wait a minute. This book, it's okay for you as a Christian to say, the Bible says. The Bible says. Oh, what? I remember a long time ago people used to say, oh, what? Your church won't let you do this? Hmm. I was looking behind me like, is my church behind me? You know, the whole church would gather behind me, and whenever time I, I got ready to make a decision, they didn't agree with, they'd look at me and go, hmm, better not. My church would, what kind of a statement is that? I had to learn a long time ago, no, it's not my church, but it's God's Word that says. And by the way, it's not the fact that my church has a Bible, but this is my book. This is my Bible. This is my final authority. That's what I'm talking about. Isn't it time that we as Christians quit just saying, oh, I've got the King James Bible, I've got the Word of God, and begin to say, hey, this is how I'm going to live. It's time to man up and say, you know what, I'm not going to hide in the shadows anymore and say, well, uh, you know what, I, I don't know, or, or I just can't learn, or I just can't read, or I just can't understand. It's time to dig into this book and say, you know what, if that's what God's Word says to do, then let's just do it. Let's just do it. Let's do it God's way. Let's do it according to His Word. And when man begins to question you, just give him a little bit of Scripture. Just tell him what the Bible says. Quit you like men. Hey, we're in a battle right now. It's time to stand some ground. Do we seek after it as we seek after other things of life? So what do you mean? You know, I consider Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 4, for those that maybe don't know, hey, he's writing this second epistle to, to Timothy. He's about to die. Listen, during that time, he was under house arrest. And, and, and he says to Timothy, The cloak that I left uh, at Troas uh, with Carpus, when thou comest, bring with thee and the books, but especially the parchments. So what is he saying? He's saying, Hey, listen, I, I need my jacket. It's kind of cold in here. But when you bring that, hey, bring the book with me, with you. And bring the parchment. Bring the Word of God. How often do we seek after the latest fashion, the latest fads, the latest cell phone, the latest TV? But how much do we seek after the latest truth from the Word of God for me? I'm not talking about something new. I'm talking about we dig into it like we did. Hey, some of you ladies, you, you, you like going through, uh, you like getting those sales ads in the mail? Any, any couponers here? <laughs> Whatever. You've couponed one time, like you cut it and you're like, can I get this free ice cream from Dairy Queen? <laughs> Mr. Vito, do you coupon? You do? 
Hey, I've seen some ladies, man, they, they got it to a science. I don't know if you do or not, but man, they come home for $3.23. They've got 18 sticks of deodorant, four, four bales, not, not, not packages, bales of toilet paper, you know, shampoo to last. I mean, even I could use it forever. <laughs> Well, anyways, hey, and I got all that stuff. Hey, I've seen some folks, uh, maybe you've seen it too, they go three or four baskets of groceries through the grocery store, and the grocery store owes them money. I'm thinking, whoa, how'd you do that? Teach me, please, right? I need that. Hey, sometimes we seek after all the best deal, the best bargain, the best this, the best that. Hey, we'll look after, I told you this morning, talking about things that are tried and tested. We'll look after all the reviews. But how much do we seek for the truths of the Word of God? We challenge our men on our prayer meetings. Hey, just go get in the book of Proverbs, Thomas. And hey, listen, Thomas, find, find one truth, one truth out of that chapter just for today. How often do we do that, though? Just find one truth for today. So Lord, give me something for today. I'm talking about making this book my book. Not just saying I have it, but making it personal. Might I suggest if the people of God would make the Word of God their own and magnify it. And listen, according to the Bible, the amount of disciples would naturally increase. You see, what do you mean? Acts chapter 6, verse 7. And the Word of God increased and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests who were Jews, right? A great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Turn the world upside down. Why? Because they took this book and they said, this is ours. We're going to live by it. We're going to preach it. We're going to seek after it. We're going to, I mean, this is right here. This is where it's at. Those of you that served in military duty, or those that have been in, in job situations where life and death was in your hands. For the power you said the word tool, there are certain tools that are to, at your disposal. And the, as a firefighter, hey, you don't go out there with a bucket of grease. Take your toolbox with you. If we're going to fight the fight of faith, we've got to make this ours. It's time to quit setting it down and start picking it up. It's time to quit dusting it off. It's time to get into it. Dig and dig and dig. Number two, it's time that we as God people, listen, we must make Bible convictions our convictions. I emphasize Bible convictions. Let me say something real quick. There is a difference between a a preference and a conviction. I understand that. I prefer, and evidently so do you as a church, I prefer growing a beard. Why? Because I hate shaving. And then I shave and I come to church and people go, ah, you know, ah, I never thought I'd hear a church say to their pastor, please grow a beard, please, please. Listen, I grew up, years gone by, listen, in old-fashioned fundamentalism, it, it used to be, listen, the preacher that had a beard, I mean, he was a liberal. That's what it was. That's what folks believed. And some of you maybe understood that. Listen, it was, hey, someone who grew a beard, he was, he was a rebel because he didn't want to be clean shaven. And that was the mindset. Now, can you show me anywhere in Scripture that, that, that preference or, or, or that, that conviction, why it is what it is? I, I, I can't find it. And if you say, well, you know what, uh, whatever you want to say, last time I checked, Jesus had a beard, so if a beard means you're a rebel, then Jesus must be a rebel. Just saying. If we're going to hold fast to it and make that our Bible, I remember in Bible college kind of sometimes arguing these points, and then here's what was said to me in Bible college, but the, 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 hey, listen, the Word of God commands you to, to fall under authority, and according to this college, you're going to remain clean shaven. Well, that was Bible. <laughs> so, guess what I did every day? Well, every other day. <laughs> it hurt too much to shave every day. That's a preference. Now, be careful when we find some Bible convictions and we go, well, that's just your preference. Today, that word is thrown around so much. When there's Bible proof for it, then it's not a preference. 
And thus I say, it's time for us as Christians to make Bible convictions our convictions. Why? Can I just consider, have you consider with me for a moment what it took for you to have Victory Baptist Church? Well, a preacher had to come. No, 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 no. You know, to have Victory Baptist Church began long before any of us were ever here. There was a group of people, listen, in the early church days that were running in the hills, hiding in caves, literally underground holding church services, trying to stay alive because their lives were under persecution and they were risking their lives by living by the faith that the Bible says which was once delivered unto the saints. Go back and read, listen, the story uh, or, or the book, uh, a tr The Trail of Blood. Go back and read Fox's Book of Martyrs, and you read about how there's folks that died burning at the stake. There's folks that died, listen, being, being wrapped up in, in animal skins and left out in the wilderness until either one, a wild beast would come and eat them, or two, the sun would evaporate all the moisture out of the skin until they were literally squeezed to death. Go back and read about the Christians that they would hollow out a log when the Bible says that they were torn asunder. What is it talking about? Uh, there were folks that many times they would hollow out a log and put the Christian inside the log and they would close the log and they would cut with a saw, not a electric saw, but a hand saw, the Christian and the wood inside. These are things that truly happen to folks. Why? Because they had Bible convictions. And the rest of the world didn't like the Bible conviction. If you go read about the medieval times and you read about the dark ages, do you know who the folks that were dying were? Christians. Christians. Listen, don't shy away from the truth. Hey, the Catholic Church said, listen, you are not going to believe that. You're not going to teach that. You're not going to get the Word of God in the hands of the common man. Hey, they would put you to death. William Tyndall died burning at the stake, and instead of crying out in pain, he cried out, Oh God, please open the eyes of the king, before the King James Bible was ever opened and written. I'm telling you, listen, there were mamas and daddies that, daddies that, that uh, watched their children's fingernails ripped out from their hands and toenails ripped out of their feet, and they would say to you, Mama, listen, deny Christ and we'll stop. Why? Because there were some folks that had Bible convictions. They lived according to the Word of God, so they stood out as different than the rest of quote-unquote religion. They couldn't hide amongst the masses because they stood out. They were different. Why? They had Bible convictions. Thus the Word of God tells us in Psalm 16, 6, The lions are fallen unto me in pleasant places. Yea, I have a goodly heritage. Why did those who stood before us, why did they draw the battle lines where they drew? When they said, hey, we're drawing the line in the sand, if you could just illustrate for a moment. And our church and our families, we're not crossing this line. Was there a reason for that? Was there a reason they said, we're going to hold on to this Bible conviction and we're staying on this side and not going over there? If there was a reason, shouldn't we maybe get back to those reasons instead of questioning everything from the Word of God? Now, I'm not against questioning for understanding, but here's what we do. Well, I just don't understand. I just don't get it. I don't see why it's important. You know, I found out, Brother Forrest, a long time ago in junior high and high school, Many times I didn't see things because I didn't want to see them. I don't see why my dad makes me have to do this. I remember my dad used to tell me over and over when I first, first started helping him work on cars, he would, and it would be so annoying listening to him do it. Maintenance, maintenance, maintenance. He would say, he'd repeat it like I heard you the first time. There's no reason to say it three times. <coughs> But he would say it, maintenance, maintenance, maintenance. Change your oil, check your tires, da 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 and oh, oh, yes, I get it, I get it, I get it, I get it. I don't see why you have to harp on me so much until my first car spun a bang bearing because the oil itself was 
contaminated with fuel because my carburetor was not operating sufficiently. And what did dad say to me when my engine locked up? Maintenance. 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 And it's like, oh, that's why. <laughs> Have you not understood that sometimes we don't see the whys because we don't want to, or maybe we've not been in that scenario Why we go, that makes sense. But there is a reason. There's a reason for Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. There's a reason. There's a reason for prayer meetings. There's a reason for the old hymns of the faith. Hey, there's a reason. Uh, church, listen, my personal conviction, and I just think it's a Bible conviction, this is not, and, and I, I catch myself saying it often, and I get frustrated with myself, this is not an auditorium. It's not a place for concerts. This is a sanctuary, a place where we meet God. This is not a stage. This is a platform. Hey, when someone gets up and sings unto God, hey, my personal convictions, listen, I'm just telling you what they are. Hey, they're not performing for the people. They're singing unto God. Therefore, when they're done, I don't clap. Amen. I say amen. amen. Because, listen, I say amen to say I agree with them. I don't clap to applaud them because they gave me a good performance. We're not here to perform. That's right. not what it's about. This is serving God. Amen. Hey, there's a reason why we have an offering every service. There's, a re there's reasons. It's in the Bible. and we, we have Bible convictions. And let's get back to old-fashioned Bible convictions. And it's, it's time that we as Christians quit sitting on the side and quit saying, well, I just don't get it. Well, that's not the way mama did it, or that's not the way so-and-so did it. Or, well, you know, that preacher over there, and listen, it, all that doesn't matter. What does God say in His Word? Now, if we don't understand where it comes from, then that's all right. Hey, let's find out where it's at in God's Word. And then when you find it, let's stick to it. Maybe some of you say, why do we always stand up every time we read the Bible? Well, there's a principle that we see in Ezra's day when they, people stood when the red, Word of God was read. As they stood as a, as a sign of reverence to the Word of God. Yes, sir. That's what it was about. Bible conviction. Hey, why, why a pulpit? Hey, isn't it time to modernize our church a little bit? Let's get a plexiglass pulpit. Right? No, Ezra stood upon a pulpit of wood, the Bible says. I don't know why God emphasized wood, but He put it in there. And so if He put it in there, guess what, Brother Seifert? I'm just going to say, well, there's probably a reason. Yes, so I'm going to stick to the wood. Amen. Amen. Just what we're going to do. Now, does God say in His Word what color of carpet our church ought to have? No. Does God say in His Word what time Sunday school ought to start? No. Does God say in His Word how, how long a Bible message ought to be? Yes. He said Peter preached, or Paul preached at midnight. Yep. No, I'm just <laughs> hey, He started at 11. <laughs> Amen. They started much earlier than that. Listen, instead of finding the answers for the Bible convictions, instead we like to argue the point. And then some of us, not, not, I'm not speaking specifically of us as Victory Baptist Church, but some of us in Christendom not only question, but even condemn others who have stronger convictions than we do. The Bible tells us of a, through illustration of a woman that's crossing a river in the book of Isaiah. And it says, she lifted up her garment, she lifted up her skirt, and she made bare the thigh. And God says, because of your nakedness. But wait a minute. Did she just lift up her skirt crossing the river, or did she take all her clothes off? Well, the Bible says she just lifted up her skirt. She made bare her thigh. And God called it nakedness. I didn't draw the line. God did. So in the time we go, okay, well, if that's nakedness, then I keep my thighs covered. And I mean, if, this, if that's what God says, then okay. Well, well, you know how hard it is? You know how hot it gets in Texas? God had no idea when he's declared that how hot it got in Texas. <laughs> Seriously? Do you know how hot it gets in the Middle East? Brother Matthews? Yeah. And we're complaining in Texas? Yeah. Yeah. I was fully clothed there too. Yeah. Yeah. Thank God. <laughs> hey, if not, we might have won. No. <laughs> no. Hey, listen. And so you have some. I remember one time we first, when we first came to Sanger, there was already rumors going on about our church that if, if you didn't have a skirt down to your ankles, you're not allowed on the front door. Yeah, and I'm like, yeah, definitely. 
And I'm thinking, wait, what? So if somebody else, listen, if it's, if the Bible says you made bare the thigh, you uncovered your nakedness, and so we keep our, and you say, well, I'm going to keep my, my clothes to here, and somebody else keeps their clothes to there, do you ridicule them? No. So their clothes are a little bit longer. Who cares? As long as I make sure I'm doing what God says. Hey, some preacher says to me, even if he says, listen, I, I just don't think a preacher ought to have a beard. Well, that's fine. That's your opinion. I'm not going to ridicule and condemn him. What good does that do? And you know, in Christianity, too often we condemn others because they stand somewhere. Listen, it's not our, the accuser of the brethren is Satan, not us. So it's time we quit accusing each other. And instead, we just go ahead and decide we're going to live by Bible conviction. Well, but brother so-and-so, his says Bible conviction. Listen, that's for brother so-and-so to decide. You better decide what your Bible conviction is and why. And by the way, why is not, well, because everybody's doing it. That's not Bible. Right? Well, <laughs> preacher, don't you know <laughs> that is so 1980? This is 2017. You need to catch up with the times. I'm sorry, but Bible convictions never catch up with the times. Right. It's time for the times to catch up with Bible convictions, right? Amen. Wherefore, come out, come out from among them, be ye separate, say, the Lord touch not the unclean thing. He said to sanctify yourselves. He said, be ye holy, for I am holy. Listen, we can go on and on and on and on. It's time we make Bible convictions our convictions. Why? Because it's time for us to line up with the Word of God that we said is ours to where society looks at us and says, you really believe that stuff, don't you? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. And then thirdly, thirdly, we must make the faith our faith. There are too many Christians, even in strong Bible preaching, Bible teaching Baptist churches today that don't know what the faith is. How many gods do you serve? But I thought you said it's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Isn't that three? Now, if I ask you to prove it to me from the Bible, could you? Some are shaking yes. Some are going, please don't. <laughs> right? Let's take you right down, down the street. There's a church that believes in what's called the oneness doctrine. <laughs> that God is not three in one, but however he's one and he's just in different times manifest himself in three different ways. But he was always just one. And it's like, no, because there's times in the scripture when the, all three of them were present. Right. Well, don't, don't mess up my doctrine with Bible. First time, one of the first times I went to church, I had a, there was a youth pastor, and, and it was in a big room, and, and it was dark, and they had a projector, and they had some songs, and we sang some songs, and the, and the youth pastor told a story about, about him getting drunk, and, and yeah, and him driving through the, 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 the fields, and, and, and he couldn't remember anything, but the next day, he saw all the damage done to his dad's truck, and because and, and, he went through the cornfields, and, and that's about all I remember. I didn't remember any Bible from the lesson, but I remember thinking, dude got drunk, and he's a youth pastor, and he's promoting the fact that he got drunk as a teenager. Bad juju. But towards the end of his whole thing, he says, let's all just praise God in our own tongue. How do you praise God in your tongue? I'm thinking, how do you, how do, you do that? I kid you not, literally, right about then, it's dark in the room. Hardly any light except for the light from the projector. And a crowd of teenagers start, listen, some of them are standing and doing this. Some of them, listen, their hands are going up and down. And then all of a sudden, in like all synchronization, they all start going, and I'm like, I'm standing there, somebody, I've never been to church in my entire life, and I'm looking going, that's what I'm supposed to do? Mm-mm. 
Why not? You know how many Baptists sit in churches today that do that? Because they don't know what the Bible teaches about tongues. It's exciting. Hey, there's, there's adventure. There's all the things going on. Hey, it's about like Israel this day. They had a shout, but God was not there. Listen, when you preach the Bible, and when you preach very strongly Bible doctrine, here's what everybody says to you. Oh, you think you're the only one going to heaven, don't you? Well, you know, people actually told me that. And you know what I told them? Absolutely not. I'm not thinking I'm the only one going to heaven. Baptists aren't the only ones going to heaven. The Bible said you, you never said you go to heaven because you're a Baptist. As a matter of fact, there's a bunch of Baptists that are going to die and go to hell. Because they had a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. You're not going to heaven because you're in a Baptist church. You're not going to heaven because you were baptized in a Baptist church, or because mama was Baptist, daddy was Baptist, or even if mama and daddy both were Baptist preachers. You say, that's not possible. Yeah, I agree. But others disagree. But isn't it time for us to make the faith our faith? Well, what's the faith? In, you know, in order to make the faith our faith, then the faith is singular. Preacher, don't you know that we all just serve God just different ways? Do we? When the doctrine's different, where does it come from? Well, I've had people tell me this. Preacher, I went to this church and that church, and they taught the exact same things that we teach here. Hmm. Brother Seaford, if they taught the exact same things that we teach here, then in times of the dark ages, they wouldn't have put Baptists to death. Go back and read history. Yeah. 50 million Baptists put to death because of the faith. Yes, if they teach the same thing, why would they put us to death? Yeah. Well, most of us, the important things. Here, here's, the, here's the new theological stance on that. Well, the, the, those are the non-essential doctrines. <laughs> Seriously, that's what they say. Tell me what truth is non-essential. If it's non-essential doctrine, then it's not necessary. That's what non-essential means. Well, as long as they preach, preach Jesus, his death, burial, and resurrection. Well, I, I'm glad they preach that, but we ought to be preaching the rest of it too. God never said just preach the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. The rest you just wash under the carpet. No, he said preach the whole counsel of the word of God, the entire thing. But it's time for us as a church and us as a people and us as individual Christians to make the faith our faith. Paul, or Jude said, I exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith. In Acts chapter 16, and so the churches were established in the faith. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 5, Paul says to examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith. In 1 Corinthians 16 verse 13, we said this earlier, he said, watch ye stand fast in the faith faith. In Colossians 2 verse 7 it says we're to be rooted and built up in Him and established in the faith. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 4 7 I fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. There's only one. You mean there's only one truth? That's what makes it truth. <laughs> Does it not? Well that's just your opinion. Truth is never opinion. My opinion doesn't matter when it comes to truth, does it? Well, I just don't think that we need to. I, I, I learned a long time ago, it didn't matter what I thought. It mattered what God thought. As your pastor, you know what? There's a lot of things that I think. And sometimes that I sit in my prayer closet and I say, I think I need to preach a message on it. And God says, no, you don't. But God, don't you know? Yes, I do. Okay, you're right. Well, I think that what we need. And God says, mm -mm, no, we don't. You should be God actually talks to you. Hello? You do not believe in the Holy Spirit of God like I do? The Bible says he, hey, he, he, he guides us in all truth, right? However, you say, preacher, why are so many churches going away from the faith? 1 Timothy chapter 6, the Bible says, For we brought nothing into this world, and it's certain we can carry nothing out. 
You believe that? Job said, naked I came, naked I go, right? What are you going to take with you when you're dead? Not a thing. And so, Paul told Timothy, and having food and raiment, let us be there with content. Since we're not taking it with us, as long as we're clothed, as long as we have food in our bellies, we should be pretty happy, right? But, he says in verse 9, they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. Well, why? Well, verse 10, for the love of money is the root of all, not money, but the love of money. And then we quote that, but we stop. But the verse doesn't stop there. Right. It continues. Which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. How many of you are like me? You ever drive down the road and you see all of a sudden out of nowhere pops up this church building and it's huge. And there's a bunch of cars and they got concrete parking lot with lights. And you, you're driving through and you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. It's not fair. We're trying to keep the faith in. We don't have a concrete parking lot. <laughs> And a basketball goal too? Oh. And it's like they just pop up out of nowhere, right? Hey, have you ever gone online and looked up some of those churches and you went, oh. Yes, yes, for years. For years? Yes. Yeah. Yes. They don't even teach the Bible. You can, you can actually go to that church and never take your Bible and never miss out a thing. Some of them. And you go, Why? Did you not notice the verse we just read? The love of money is the root of all evil for which while some coveted after, hey, they compromised for what? Money. Preacher, don't you know we get more people in here and that means the tithes and offerings would go up and we get a nicer facility. If you would just calm down a little bit. <laughs> hey, it's not time to calm down. It's time to quit you like men. You know, preacher, you know what? If, if We've got this nice little projector screen right here. Look, look, watch this. Ready? Ooh. Yeah. Ah. I love preaching here. This is a great church. <laughs> Y'all are right on board. You, you realize with that, with that thing, hey, we can put the hymn books away, and, and we, can, we can get the, all, the atmosphere in the church service. Man, it'd be, it'd be it, woof. everybody look up and sing. We just, we'll just sing the same, we'll sing the same hymns. We're just going to look up there for the words, that's all. You go and watch the churches that start there. It never stops there. Why? Because the karaoke, the karaoke church service, it doesn't stop with traditional sacred music. Before you know it, I'm not going there. Hey, for the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith. There's a Bible reason, and this book is my book, and Bible convictions are my convictions, and listen, the faith is my faith, and so it's time for me to stand up and be like a man and say, you know what, we are not going to do those things, we're not going to go that direction, and we're going to stick to this book. But you know what makes a church so powerful and strong? When it's not just the pastor doing it, but the membership does it too. And then just imagine what God's going to do at Victory Baptist Church. You know why God, I think, has blessed over these past six years so much? Because some of you have begun to do the same things. And as you do that, God has brought people in here. Have, you, have anybody been amazed if sometimes you bring somebody in here and they actually believe like you? And you're like, wow, they're already like one of us. Cool. And, and then we get some new ones in here. And they look at us, and they look around. You see them in the service sometimes? They're like, not sure what to think. But then before you know it, they begin to enjoy it. And they're like, you know what? I want what y'all have. Why is this happening? Because we make this book our book. We make Bible convictions our convictions. We make the faith our faith. It's not easy. It's going to take work. It's going to take a battle. 
That's why we as Christians must quit ye like men. And let me conclude with saying this. I'm going to take that quit ye out of the Bible context and say again, the word means to be like or to show yourself as, but it's time we also quit like men. And men don't quit when they're doing what's right. I don't care. Listen, somebody walks inside your home, men, and they try to destroy and or harm your family. I don't care how rough it gets. We don't quit, right? Listen, until someone's dead, me or them, we don't quit. You said that from the pulpit, until someone's dead, me or them, we don't quit, right? And by the way, Satan's trying to destroy your family, your home, your church, your marriage, and it's not time to quit until someone's dead. Last time I checked, you're not and he's not, so it's time to quit like men and keep on fighting. Lord, we thank you for the day you've given us. Thank you for the opportunity we have to be in church and, Lord, to be in your word and, Lord, to be gathered together. Lord, as we just see Israel this day, Lord, they had all the right words and the right things and their trust was misplaced. They didn't even realize that God had departed. Lord, I just believe if we'd get in the book, we would know when you're gone. We would know your will. If we would, if we would make Bible convictions our convictions, Lord, we would know, Lord, your blessings. If we make the faith our faith, God, we'd see you at work. And God, we're not doing these things to say, look at us. We were, we're all right and everyone else is wrong. God, we just want to be blessed of you. We want to honor you. We want to praise you. God, we want your work done your way. It's not about us, Lord. It's about you. And we want you to be pleased. Would you teach us and instruct us from thy word? Would you guide us through your spirit? And God, would you help us to have the right convictions? and the right doctrine, the right truth, and not just for today, but Lord, for the entire existence of Victory Baptist Church. Help us, we ask, in Jesus' name, amen.